All right, so this is the first of three lectures covering the male reproductive tract, and in this lecture we're going to talk about the testes. So the testes are the male gonads, um, analogous to the female ovaries, um, and they really have two main functions, spermatogenesis, which is the generation of sperm, and then they also uh, produce reproductive hormones, mainly testosterone, so they're responsible for all the secondary sex changes that would result from testosterone production. Um, so during development, initially, the testicles will form in the abdomen, retroperitoneally, which is a key th uh, spatial relationship to know, and then they descend into the permanent location within the scrotum. They have two um, kind of thick connective tissue coverings. Um, the first of those is the tunico, tunica albuginea, which is a fibrous capsule, and it encloses the testes. Um, so it's on, the, on the, the first layer to enclose the testes, and it extends actually into the parenchyma of the testes and divides it into lobules or functional units, and we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about the microanatomy of the testy. Um, outside of the tunica, or enclosing the tunica albuginea is the tunica vaginalis, which is a two-layer. They have a parietal layer and a visceral layer, and this is really a serous membrane, and it's ex and it, which encloses... Um, the testes around the tunica albuginea. So here's the tunica vaginalis here, so it's this layer here that kind of encloses in the diagram here. Um, now again, back to that tunica, this kind of white um, section here in the diagram represents the tunica albuginea, and as, it's, as you can see, it's extending here into the parenchyma as the creating these lobules, which are kind of these functional units of the testes where spermatogenesis occurs. Um, so spermatogenesis occurs here in the seminiferous tubules, so these lobules are these sections. Those are the seminiferous tubules, so right here. Um, and then as sperm is created, it's, it has to be um, carried out of the testicle um, for eventually um, being released during ejaculation. And so it initially connect, uh, collects here in the ready testes. So this is our ready testes here. Um, and then from here, it gets um, collected. It travels down the efferent duct ductules. Um, or efferent tubules, and these transport sperm from the red testes to the epididymis. Um, and the epididymis has three parts. It has the head of the epididymis, so here's the head. Um, it has the body here, and then it has the tail here. And so the sperm is collected here into, from the efferent ductules into the head of the epididymis, and then it goes through the body and then into the tail, and then the tail is what is continuous with the vas de deferens or ductus deferens. Um, which then carries it um, into the ejaculatory ducts and eventually into the urethra. Now, the blood supply to the testicles, um, it's via the testicular artery, which branches directly off the aorta in the abdomen, so it's an abdominal vessel, and it branches off at the L2 level. And after it branches off and travels in the abdomen, it passes through the inguinal canal within the spermatic cord. So as you can see here, it's coming in, it's kind of in this red portion here in the diagram, and it comes down and it supplies the testicle directly. So the venous drain is via the testicular vein, and the testicular vein, like the testicular artery, travels in the spermatic cord and then through the inguinal canal, and then it comes up into the abdomen. And it has some unique drainage, kind of analogous to the ovarian veins in the female. And these are, again, this is a topic that's both high yield for board exams, then it's also important clinically. So you have the right testicular vein, which dra drains directly into the IVC. Um, so you see it coming up here on the right side, and then it, it, it drains at this kind of vertical angle. So if we draw kind of a straight line down the IVC here, it's, it's kind of like at a nice vertical angle here. Versus the left vein, which drains into the, ren the left renal vein. So similar to the left ovarian vein, which drains into the left renal vein, the left testicular vein just is the same. It drains into the left renal vein, um, and it drains at this 90 degree angle. So if we draw a straight line through the renal vein, and then a straight line through the uh, left testicular vein, it creates this 90 degree angle. And what that does is it creates more resistance to flow um, because it has to travel directly against gravity at, the, um, at, a 90 degree, at a 90 degree angle. And so as a result of that, flow isn't as efficient in the left renal vein. And so what happens is the venous blood accumulates moderately more in the left testicle, which causes it to hang a little bit lower than the left. So there's a little more weight as a result of this kind of venous blood backup. Um, and that's a result of it causing it to hang lower. And this is a normal phenomenon. It's just no, due to this normal anatomy. Now, the other venous structure to be aware of is the pampiniform plexus. Now, the testicular vein is the main venous drainage source. The pampiniform 
plexus is actually has a different, more of a different function than venous drainage. Um, so it wraps around the testicular artery. So you can see that here in the diagram. So in the red here, we have the testicular artery. And then this kind of um, baggy, like net looking structure is the pampaniform plexus. And it more serves as um, a temperature regulator. So what it does is it is it serves to cool the, the warm arterial blood coming into the testicle. So, and the idea of that is to kind of create the ideal temperature to make sure it doesn't get too warm within the testicles so that um, they can operate at an ideal temperature for spermatogenesis because it can't be too warm um, for spermatogenesis. And now the lymph drainage, which is important to know because it's relevant for uh, testicular cancer, lymph drainage goes to the lumbar and paraaortic nodes. Um, another clinical application, the cryptor, uh, cryptorchidism. This is a failure of the testicle to descend during development into the scrotal sac. So now remember, we talked about how the, te the testicles during development, they begin here in the abdomen, and then they slowly descend retroperitoneally down to their final resting place within the scrotal sac. Now what happens is, is cryptorchidism is a condition where this doesn't happen. Either they get caught they get caught somewhere along this track, either in the abdomen or maybe even in the pelvis, but they just don't make it down into the scrotal sac. Now this can be a bilateral or it can be just unilateral. Now what the problem is is this increases the risk for infertility because you don't have the testicle down here into the scrotum at an ideal temperature. Now, like we were talking about with the pampiniform plexus, the testicles need to be at an ideal temperature to properly carry out spermatogenesis. So if they're not up here down in the scrotal sac and they're kind of hanging out in the abdomen, they're, you, know, you may not have uh, efficient or adequate spermatogenesis which can then increase the risk for infer infertility. Another thing that these patients are at, at risk for is testicular cancer. So the treatment for these um, boys is that you observe them until it resolves spontaneously. That's the hope. If that doesn't happen, though, is you can do a surgery called orchiopexy. Now what this is is, so let's say we have a scrotal sac here, and we have a testicle that hasn't descended fully. So what they do is they pull the testicle down into here, into the scrotal sac, and then they surgically um, fix it into the sac so that it can't, move or, um, uh, you know, reflux back into the abdomen. Um, testicular torsion, very serious condition. What this is, it's similar to ovarian torsion. Um, it's, you know, it's a twisting pathology, so it involves twisting of the spermatic cord. Um, so if you look in the diagram here, here's your spermatic cord. So what you have is kind of a twisting um, phenomenon of the of the cord. And what this, what happens is, is it's not um, because you, you compress the arteries, it's more because you can compress the veins. And the reason for that is, is the arteries have a very thick muscular wall, and so they're not as easily compressed. So really arterial uh, blood flow is still maintained. The problem is, is you compress the venous drainage. So as a result of that, so if we draw in the venous drainage here, and you, you cut off venous drainage, is it causes a buildup of pressure. And so as, as a result of that, it bl uh, blood tends to back up into the uh, testicle instead of being drained out. And so what, what happens is, is this causes an increased risk for um, hemorrhagic infarction because the blood is backed up in here and then as a result it hemorrhages and causes an infarction in the testicle. Um, it can even re result in loss of the testicle. So that's why it's a medical emergency. And really well, the way these patients present is they have really intense groin pain. Um, they really have no other constitutional symptoms like fevers or chills. They will have an absent cremasteric reflex, and the reason for that is, is, that, is that you have the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve that travels in the spermatic cord, and that gets compressed by the twisting action. So you uh, one of the ways you can detect this on physical exam is they have an absent um, cremasteric reflex. Um, now, the other thing that is, is important to note is that cryptoarchidism puts you at risk for this because if you have a kind of freely um, floating testicle that isn't properly descended, it can also put them at risk for testicular torsion. Um, now, again, also what can happen it, to put a patient at risk for this is maybe the testicles make it down uh, into their proper place, but they just developmentally, they don't properly attach to the scrotal lining. So they're kind of free floating within um, the scrotal sac here, and that can also occur. And then the, since this is an emergency, the, the treatment is surgery, usually um, hopefully to correct the, the idea is to hopefully correct the, the torsion on the, on the spermatic cord so that you can restore venous drainage and restore um, proper circulation within the testicle. If it's reached the point where the testicle is um, not salvageable, then you may need to remove the testicle, unfortunately. Um, so surgery is usually the definitive treatment in these patients.
Hydrocele, now this is a condition where you have excess fluid collection between the parietal and visceral layers of that tunica van vaginalis. So if we kind of blow this up here, you have your parietal layer here. And then you have your visceral layer here. And just with all visceral and parietal layers in, of any part of the body, you have a potential space here. So what happens here is you kind of have a buildup of fluid within um, within this space. And so this can be due to either excess serous fluid kind of secreted by the membrane. Um, it can result of like irritation or inflammation within the testicle or within the, the serous membrane, or it can result from lymphatic blockage. So, um, you know, serous sanguinous fluid isn't getting um, drained properly, and so it builds up and then it leaks into this potential space. Now, what happens is, is you get scrotal swelling. Um, and what's important to note here is, so if you have, is if you have a scrotal swelling like this, is if you shine a light um, through uh, on the scrotum, and this is actually a clinical test that's done, is it'll transilluminate, um, and so you can see the light come through on the other side. Now, and since all that really is is fluid, if there was, was more of a mass, so like versus testicular cancer where there's actually a mass here, the light can't get through. It doesn't happen. And so you don't, it doesn't transilluminate. And so that's a way you can tell on physical exam a tumor versus a hydrocele. Now, the good news is, is usually these will resolve on their own, and there's not really any treatment that's necessary. Much less serious condition than testicular torsion. Hematocele, very similar to the hydrocele, except instead of a serous fluid, it's an accumulation of blood, again, in between those parietal and visceral layers. So if you have the parietal layer here and the visceral layer here, what you have is blood that occurs in here. And usually what this is due to is trauma to the testes themselves or trauma to the spermatic cord. Uh, varicocele, this is a obstruction of the venous drainage that leads to significant dilation of the spermatic vein. So you have significant drainage in here. And what it usually feels like is a bag of worms on palpation because you have all this venous congestion within here. And so when the physician will palpate in this area, it feels like there's a bag that, you know, there's a bunch of worms in here because all these veins are uh, severely dilated um, and congested. Now, what's important to note is, again, the reason why we took the time to go over the um, unique anatomy of the right and left uh, testicular uh, vein is because the varicocele is more likely to occur on the left because of the testicular vein draining into the left renal vein at this 90 degree angle. Again, remember this 90 degree angle cr creates more of an obstruction to flow, so more of a resistance to flow. So it's more likely that you're going to have a problem where it, with venous congestion down here um, within the scrotal sac. And so as a result of this um, you know, anatomy creating more of an obstruction of flow. It causes the flow to back up and back up, and then you have the venous congestion in here. Um, an important note is that renal cell carcinoma, which is a very common tumor of the kidney, it tends to, um, the, what the tumor will do is it's in the kidney here, and what it tends to do is invade the renal vein. This is just a common characteristic of these tumors. doesn't matter if it's on the right or the left. It tends to invade the renal vein. And when it does that on the left, if it's a left kidney tumor, it can cause varicocele because as it invades the renal vein and it invades far enough, it can obstruct this left testicular vein draining into the left renal vein. So if you have this tumor mass obstructing flow, that's going to severely increase your chance of causing a varicocele on the left side. Um, so that can be a, a sign of a patient with renal cancer. If they kind of have uh, flank pain, hematuria, if they have varicocele, that's, you know, if that's on a board question, you definitely want to be very, very suspicious of a left side renal cell carcinoma. Um, another thing to note is an elderly gentleman if, you, if they have an acute onset, so it's not a chronic thing, if they come in, you know, with a one-day history of right-sided varicocele, that's much more highly suspicious for an abdominal malignancy obstructing the IVC because what happens is it obstructs the IVC and then it blocks flow um, back up into the, into the right side. So if you have a right side of varicocele, you definitely, and especially in an elderly gentleman, and why? Because cancer is a disease of aging, so it happens more in older people and so you want to be suspicious of an abdominal tumor could be a renal cell tumor could be a GI tumor could be any type of tumor that would affect or obstruct on the IVC so you definitely in an elderly gentleman you would not want to miss that um, testicular cancer what this is is a malignant mass that occurs within the testicular tissue itself 
usually develops from either germ cells or the sex cord stromal cells that are within the testicle. Um, there's many, many types of these tumors. So if you want to learn more about those, I suggest you consult a pathology textbook and you can learn all about the different um, pathogenesis of these tumors. Um, but in general, what these, what these tumors will present as is the, as a firm, painless testicular mass. So that's the key term is painless. Um, and they're a firm mass found in the testicles. They, this is usually a disease of younger men. Um, so it's this is usually now I know I just said in the last slide that you know cancer is a disease of the of the elderly. This is and for testicular cancer it's kind of reverse. It's usually men like in their 20s, thir early 30s are are much more at risk for this disease, which is why you know you see primary care docs really promoting testicular exams for younger men um, because you do not want to miss this because this is a very easily treated and very easily cured um, cancer. Now, on physical exam, what to be noted for besides the painless testicular mass? Um, like we talked about with the hydrocel, if you shine a light on the on the uh, scrotal on the scrotum here, is you will not be able to transilluminate. The light will not get through because if there's a tumor here, if there's a large tumor mass, it's going to block any light that comes through, and so it's not it's not transilluminated. Um, usually, you do not biopsy biopsy these tumors. The reason why is is if you stick a needle in here to do a biopsy when you pull that needle out. So when you pull it out this way, you could potentially seed the scrotal uh, tissue and scrotal skin. And what that could do is you could seed it with malignant cells and put them at risk for scrotal cancer, which you definitely do not want to do. So really with the, with the thought, the first step in management of these is really to just do an ultrasound to confirm and then do uh, surgery just to remove it. You don't even bother with a biopsy. Um, Important also with lymphatic uh, metastasis to know is, is the paraaortic lymph nodes is where these tend to metastasize. Um, hematogenously, if they spread hematogenously, they tend to go to the lung. So you could have a, a patient come in with a testicular tumor and they could have symptoms of shortness of breath, coughing, hemoptysis, and that would be a, a patient that would unfortunately have a lung metastasis. And again, like I said, the treatment is radical or orchiectomy, which is complete removal of the testicle. So none of, it, none of the testicular tissue is left behind because um, you want to completely eliminate the risk of any recurrence. And these, this is typically a very successful operation. Usually is, if this is caught early enough, this is a, a disease that can be very uh, well treated with a very good prognosis. Um, scrotal cancer, and since it's more of the skin, it's a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and it's of the skin of the scrotum, and it's usually seen in, with uh, various occupational exposures, so exposure to very, uh, various like organic carcinogens. It was originally discovered to occur in the chimney sweeps in London in the, in the 1700s. Um, just a little history, the chimney sweeps were people that would literally jump down the chimneys and sweep them and clean them. And with these, they were exposed to the kind of the soot within the, from the smoke and the fires and within the chimneys, the soot would actually put... Um, these patients uh, increased their risk of scrotal cancer. It caused um, kind of a carcinogenic event. Um, and so that was when this, this disease was first discovered. Now, subsequently, there's different other organic um, carcinogens they've discovered in the meantime that put patients at risk for these uh, tumors. And these tumors, to compare versus uh, testicular cancer, they metastasize to the inguinal nodes. So these can be caught more easily versus the paraaortic nodes for um, testicular cancer. And that's a por an important um, distinction to be, to be made um, because that's something a board exam would like to test you on. They'll, be, they'll say something like it's a scrotal mass and then they find inguinal lymph node mass. Then you want to be more suspicious of a scrotal cancer than versus a testicular cancer. All right, and that closes out our discussion of the testes. In the next lecture for the male reproductive tract, we're going to talk about the ejaculatory glands and ducts.